to Mind Escape. Are you ready? Are you ready to escape your mind? All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 308 tonight. We have a special show. We actually, this will be kind of interesting. This is the most guests we've had on at one time, which is three. Uh, we have Alex, Brandon, and Cody on to discuss their documentary called Entheo Magus, uh, which basically looks at the origins of Mormonism and takes into account local entheogens and you know, plants and stuff like that in the area. Um, I, I actually watched it. They gave me an early look. I loved it. I think it'll be very interesting to people that like that kind of stuff and um, which are all of you nerds out there listening to the show right now. So, uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. And um, before we get started, if you want to support Mind Escape, the best way to do that is to click the link tree link down below um and yeah there's plenty of stuff on there patreon we've got watch our documentary check out our documentary as within so without from ufos to dmt um which kind of is a i guess adjacent in a way to your documentary in the sense that like it looks at metaphysics and the possible origins of the ideas of metaphysics and things like that so go check that out and yeah leave us a nice review if you like what we're doing so um but uh yeah so without further uh you know ado alex uh brandon and cody i don't know who wants to go first but why don't you give us some information first on when your documentary will be airing or playing and then we'll go from there sure i'll step in and do that so um i'm brandon i'm the director of Antheomegas and co-producer with cody and Alex is one of the key researchers that appears in the documentary along with Cody, who's also on screen and interviewed in the documentary. So Entheomegas is, as it exists right now, it's a 40 minute documentary that uh, unveils the psychedelic origins of Mormonism. And so this is a um, topic that was, the first paper was published on this in 2007, when psychedelics were a bad word in society in general. And uh, 10 years later, Cody and another researcher who appears in the documentary, his name's Bryce Blankenagel, they appeared um, or they, they, they've made a follow up paper to that. And so largely this work is the basis for um, the documentary. And we have screenings in Salt Lake City at the end of the month, April 27th, 28th and 29th. You can get free tickets on our website, SearStonedProductions.com, SearStonedProductions.com. And then we have another screening in Portland. Portland, Oregon, May 11th, and that's a Saturday. So April 27th through 29th in Salt Lake. And there are uh, six different options. And then uh, May 11th in Portland. Do you, are you going to, do you have a format in mind when that happens? Are you guys trying to get it on a platform like a Netflix or an Amazon? Or what do you, what's your goal there? Well, the goal is we've been tossing ideas about how do we make a mass distribution of this idea? How do we, how would he get this out there to the public? Cause it's such a wild idea. And uh, Cody and I have been tossing ideas around and we looked at the idea of doing a scripted series. We tried pitching it a couple of times and then um, thought that if we create a documentary, then we can use this as a proof of concept to pitch our scripted series or potentially make a documentary series from there. So this is a, Something that we did on our is a passion project for now with the intention of turning it into something bigger that would be on a streaming service. So that's what we're looking for is connections to a streaming service or an agent that could help us get in the door. No, I was just curious because we had to try and figure that on the go when we did our documentary and we ended up, you know, there was some options to try and monetize it, but just, I'm just like, let's just put this on YouTube. It's our first documentary um, you know, we did do a Patreon thing, like a director's cut where we didn't have any commercials and stuff like that. And we made a little bit of money off that, but yeah, I mean, the goal was just to get this thing out there and let people see it. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're in that same state. We're in the early stages right now and we'll, 
you know, we're, we're hoping we can get something bigger, you know? No, I, I really liked it. I, I thought you guys did a great job. The, it's very well put together in the sense that, like, it's coherent. Like, when you watch through it, you learn. It's not, like, weird pieced together kind of. Like, it's all kind of, a, you know, you go through the origins and then the, the thesis or the... Um, the hypothesis and then it kind of works off there so yeah no I, th I thought you guys did an excellent job that's cool yeah thank you um not many non-mormons have seen it or people have never been mormon i should say and so it's nice to test it with with other crowds it, it's a tough thing to do because uh even if you're familiar with mormonism there's still so much education that you have to do on this topic because mormons you know it's very taboo you, you, they, they don't participate in the talks getting subs at all not even coffee and so to be able to say you have psychedelic origins to your church there's a whole lot of education that needs to happen and then when you're talking to a crowd that doesn't have an ex any experience of mormonism you've got to also educate them on mormonism and a lot of people don't have any understanding of psychedelics or mormonism so we've got to hit all of those people and try to educate them all on this subject in 40 minutes it's it's a big undertaking so I, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, recognize the, the, yeah, uh, outline did, structure you, that we had there. You did a great uh, job. Cause I didn't really, I, like I said, I don't know. I know, I knew about like the basic origin story and the seer stone and a little bit of like the mysticism and stuff like that. But, um, I didn't really know too much about like the actual origin stories of it and how it came to be. And I thought you did a good job with that. Um, and I, again, I didn't know that much. I think the only other stuff I've really seen, I've, known a couple people through working uh, that were Mormon over the years. And then also my wife putting on like real housewives of Salt Lake city, which those, those <laughs> ladies are, are drinking and I don't think Mormons are supposed to drink or, you know, and they're, they're out there getting hammered. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so, so that was my exposure to that. And obviously we talk a lot about ancient psychedelic use and esoteric stuff and things like that on the show. So I thought that this was refreshing in the sense that I had never really thought about the connection there either that's not something that i would have put together based on what i knew so yeah yeah it's i mean all three of us you know alex cody and i have different ways in which we discovered this topic of the possible psychedelic origins of mormonism there's overlap in how we all discovered it but it is like really out there especially considering the origin story that you're told with mormonism which i can give you a basic rundown of what you hear in church what the Mormon missionaries, if they come to your house, what they're likely going to say. And I think from there, Alex and Cody can tell you this alternate history that we've uncovered um, that, that shows the relationship that the early Mormons had psychedelics. And so uh, the Mormon religion, and I use this word Mormon um, because there are many factions of Mormonism. The main faction of Mormonism is referred to as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it's headquartered in Utah. There are many other factions. All of them are smaller than that. Some are 100 or less people. Some are several thousand up to maybe 100,000. But Utah is the main capital. Now, um, the origins of Mormons, Mormonism goes back to a, a man named Joseph Smith, born in upstate New York, in the, or born in Vermont, actually. But uh, in upstate New York is where the origins of the church generally are. And uh, when he was 14 years old in 1820, there was a massive religious um, awakening in his area, and he wanted to know which church he should join. And so he studied the Bible, he pondered a lot, and one day he comes across this verse that tells him that if he wants to gain wisdom, he should ask God. So he goes into this forest behind his house, prays, and lo and behold, he has a visitation from God the Father and Jesus Christ who tell him that he shouldn't join any of the churches. And then in time, he has another visitation from an angel a few years later that tells him, hey, not far from your house, there is a golden record, a record written on golden plates, a book on golden plates that's buried in a hill by your house. You can go find it and and uh, and I'll be there and I'll show you where it is. Okay, so he goes there later, he finds this record and he um, then... Mormons will tell you by the power of God, translated it, and it became what is known as the Book of Mormon. That book became like the key factor in, in uh, having people convert to the religion, a way to proof that Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God. Um, he then organizes a church. There are further angelic visitations. Um, Mormons uh, 
um, then start to get persecuted as more as Mormons like to say, and they move from place to place and they go from New York to Ohio to Missouri to Illinois until Joseph is eventually killed. And they the main faction goes out into the West and settles in what is now Utah. So that's the gist of Mormonism. It's then grown into a global church that claims the main faction about 17 million members now and uh, is extremely powerful um, business wise, politically, um, especially in the United States, but has is a, is a global power as well. Um, but that is that's the gist of the Mormon story. Um, the origin story that you well, hear uh, outside the U.S. Where is it the most popular? Like outside of the U.S. Europe. Outside of the U.S. Yeah. Would you say, Alex? Sorry. Europe. Although supposedly the church has been growing very fast in Africa. Uh, my brother's on a mission in Ghana right now, actually, and they've baptized quite a few people out there. So it is growing pretty quick in Africa too. There was a statistic at one time that there that one in 20 people in, in Chile were Mormon and had been baptized Mormon. So it, it, were they practicing Mormons? Almost certainly no. But there's there's a huge Mormon population or a massive presence in certain countries in South America. People that at one point joined Mormonism but may not have stayed for long. But there is there is a large footprint in South America as well. Yeah. Okay, so we, we got a little history there, um, and I always like to go deep too, so I'll probably look more into the origins myself because, like I said, I knew nothing about this topic before, and some things definitely uh, piqued my interest, and I think that um, our listeners um, are pretty savvy with this stuff. I mean, I don't, just because you look into stuff too, people are like, oh, it's, you know, why are you looking into that? I, I find it interesting. Don't you, you know, don't you find it interesting that there's 17 million people that like would do anything for this cause or this religion that maybe don't even know about their own origins? And that goes for most religions, right? Like most people don't understand the origin of their own religion or whatever you want to call, you know, what they're into. So um, yeah. let's I let's. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, this is one of the things I think we'll get into the course of conversation naturally. But like, you know, you, you've talked about how you've looked into ancient religions and their ties to psychedelics and ancient cultures and such that the impetus for religion so often comes down to psychedelics. And one of the things with Mormonism that's unique is that it's a modern religion. We're talking 200 years old. And so you can look at Brian Murrescu's work and see that the Catholic church is clearly tied to a psychedelic sacrament initially. That's 2000 years old. Okay. But if you look at Mormonism and you see a modern religion is tied to psychedelics, the implications of that are big. You can go from the most ancient religions to uh, one of America's most modern religions, perhaps its most successful religion and see that it's also tied to psychedelics. And that's one of the things that's just for me is like very, um, uh, attractive to see like uh, tying religion to psychedelics when religion yeah. generally I think the the difference though if I may between like Catholicism or Catholic or Christianity for that matter between this and that is like it seems like you guys are getting pushback from a majority of the people on this where it seems like the immortality key or this idea you know, was very romanticized a few years ago because of all the crazy and evil things that have happened in the Catholic. And I, I grew up Catholic, so it's not like I'm not speaking from a place of uh, um, not knowing. But, like, I think it's coming from very different places where people are trying to repackage Catholicism or Christianity and present it in oats. Like, oh, well, this actually was happening and it seems like more romantic or more esoteric and it, it adds like more value to it as where it seems like you guys are onto something and then you're getting pushback. I would say that the, that would be the dichotomy there if, if I. Yeah. Uh, Mormonism uh, has a, a very um, polarized view of history. Um, they've gone through several different uh, revisions and, um, several different historical um, reprograms or reboots, shall we say, um, that 
I would call maybe propaganda at this point <laughs> um, in their history. So I think a lot of the reason why we get pushback, especially from mainstream members, is because, like you said, they don't know the origins of their own history, and you have to you have to dig like, into sources that a, they would categorize as anti-Mormon <laughs> a lot yeah. of the time in order to find a lot of that. You talk Sorry, to Alex. a lay Mormon, and they're gonna say that oh no joseph didn't practice magic or that was just a folly of his youth kind of thing but i i guess really that that's where we should start if we're going to go deeper into the origins of mormonism which i do have sure. to point out the I church do. was founded yeah. on april 6th so today 194 years ago in 1830 so it's a good day to be talking about it <laughs> <laughs> all right it's like the Friday the 13th of... Uh, Mormons also believe Mormons. that Jesus Christ was born on April 6th. That's, oh, that's really? another thing. That's true, mm -hmm. yeah. That actually might be, according to scholars, though, It's I think they say that it's probably a better chance that Jesus was born in the springtime based on what we know, you yeah. know? And then they switched it because of the pagan stuff, but... Yeah. Um... Very interesting. Oh, my, my one question about the seer stone stuff. This is one thing because I, I mean, I know you talked a little bit about it, but like, I remember reading something on druids, and they had kind of like had a similar thing. So like these like this esoteric cult of Celtic people, you know, had these like things that they would look through and like rocks and stuff. So kind of like a similar vibe. And we know the druids were very into the plants and the flora and fauna in the area and stuff like that. I was just curious if there was any connection to that or maybe where that came from. Yeah. So there's some connection through that. I mean, we know Joseph had access to sources about the Celts, um, but the impetus of the original seer stone actually was from another, a teenage girl at the time. Uh, her name was Sally Chase who had a, a seer stone and basically inspired Joseph to go out and find his own kind of thing. Um, but he really was pulling that from, I mean, all of these different traditions, like Joseph, what links Mormonism, especially to the show is like, you know, Joseph saw himself as restoring all of the ancient religions, you know, he was sort of creating this amalgamation of the best parts of, you know, uh, Egyptian mysticism and ritual, the Lucinian mysteries, Masonry, Rosicrucianism, he was kind of taking bits and pieces of all of this and putting it into, you know, one unified whole of a church is what his goal was. And so his, as a teenager, you know, his family was heavily steeped in all of this magic and mysticism and stuff. And his brother Hiram um, went off to school at, at Dartmouth um, when he was a kid, where he was learning all about the Greek religions and from some of the best Greek scholars of the time in the United States, and was bringing this back and teaching Joseph it. And then as a kid, Joseph went down to Salem, which was a huge hub of uh, resources and knowledge at the time. In fact, uh, one of his cousins through his uncle, uh, his uncle's wife's family was the first, uh, helped, was the first female translator of Buddhist scripture in the United States. And she was huge in a Swedenborganism, which has a lot of parallels with uh, Mormon theology and like uh, a lot of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the scriptures pulls from Swedenborg's ideas. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so we have the background on Mormonism. We What was the first piece of evidence any of you found that connected psychedelics to Joseph or entheogens to the church? And from there, did did the pieces just kind of fall into place or like explain how that kind of came to be? Where there was, uh, there's an era of the church uh, that's kind of known as like the visionary period of Mormonism. Uh, and that's Joseph's era where, you know, regularly during church services, Joseph would come to people and say like, you're going to see Christ or, or um, there's a famous uh, temple dedication uh, uh, that they performed in Kirtland where over 500 people all had a, a visionary experiences that lasted throughout the day and sometimes longer than that. Um, and with Joseph's death, that period of Mormonism kind of died out and it got very uh, quiet and kind of Quakeristic. It's very like uh, still small voice, like God speaks to you um, quietly, not in loud visionary experiences generally, um, and especially in groups. Um, so I, I think, um, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alex. Where are you? Uh, you want to pick up where I'm at? I'm. I, I have to go deal with a child issue at the moment. You're good. Oh, yeah. You're good. Yeah. No worries. I'll, yeah. I'll be right so. There. Uh, visionary era, Joseph was able to, you know, produce these mass visions on demand for people. He would tell people, hey, you guys are going to have visions tomorrow. And then they would have visions. Um, you're good. Keep going. I just pulled it up so you can go. Yeah, you're good. Um, and so we kind of need, you know, a reason for or an explanation for his ability to produce these visions on demand. And really that kind of leads us to psychedelics is, you know, um, a lot of the accounts even mimic, you know, uh, both the physiological, emotional, and sort of spiritual side effects of psychedelic use. So we see um, these accounts where even people both within and without the church were assuming that the the wine or the liquor that they were drinking was laced with something. There was actually an account from one uh, sacrament meeting where an outsider, he was a doctor, was viewing the sacrament. His name was J.J. Moss, and he tried to steal a bottle of the sacramental wine to see if he could figure out what it was laced with, but he was unsuccessful, unfortunately, because that would have been great to hear his analysis of it. Um, and so from, you know, taking a look at these visions, we kind of started looking more and more at um, the herbs that the Smith family was familiar with and his compatriots. He always had uh, an experienced herbalist in the first presidency or right by his side. So he always had someone that if he himself didn't know how to use the herb, he had someone who did know how to use it. So then we kind of start to look at, you know, th these different candidates for um, entheogenic usage. Cody, do you want to pick back up on that? Yeah, sorry about that. I heard you screaming. Um, uh, I I first came across this theory um, with uh, Robert Beckstead's 2007 paper, where he was just kind of proposing the idea that um, you know, within the context of a 19th century magic worldview, uh, that drugs were just another vehicle for visionary experiences. Um, and they were just kind of another tool in a magician's toolkit. Uh, and that Joseph probably would have used them and, and gave several uh, um, examples of things he could have been using. Um, when I found it initially, I uh, started researching this because I wanted to prove him wrong. I, I, I thought it was too like narrow-minded I, I, or too narrow in scope. Um, I, I kind of hand-waved a bunch of the, the things he originally proposed, but the more I dug into his sources and uh, his, like, uh, his presentation, I, there was actually meat there, and I, uh, I hooked up with another researcher, Bryce Blankenegel, uh, who we worked on another paper in 2017 we published at the Sunstone Symposium uh, that kind of advanced the theory and, like, here's all the stuff we found, and this guy's actually onto something. Um, and then recently, uh, uh, Alex has jumped on board and we've been working on some response papers to some Mormon historians who don't like what we're doing. Uh, uh, and that's that's kind of where we found all this uh, initially, or at least I did. And there's there's a paper on all this that I'll add the link once we're done to the show notes where all of you can check it out. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask, too, are any or any three of you, uh, or any of you, uh, Mormon or were Mormon? Yeah. All, all three of us were Mormon. Oh, okay. So I, that, that I didn't know. I just didn't know if it was like all outside research, but that makes sense. So is it in, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like for me, like when I, I'm Catholic, the first psychedelics experience I had in high school, um, I'm like, there's something here. This is what I've been looking for in church and haven't found my whole life basically. So, um, was that something that, that kind of drove all of you like, Hey, you know, we were raised in this, but there's obviously something to it. Let's, this has very, you know, this is a good explanation probably for why this came to be. Yeah. All I mean, three of us, really like yeah. <laughs> I, I stumbled onto the theory because I was doing uh, ketamine treatment for depression and anxiety and I started having visions and I was like holy shit like 
these are the same type of visions that the early Mormons were having, like same content, same sort of imagery. And all, I went, all of this makes like perfect sense now. Like this is exactly what I've been looking for kind of thing and just dove right in. And I know Brandon and Cody are fairly similar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a similar story. Like in Alex, I mean, you were you were still in yeah, the church. Yeah, I, I was an active Mormon. Mormon while I was doing yeah. it still, so. I mean, for me, what happened was I discovered Terrence McKenna. And this is why I was still fully Mormon. And I listened to him and, and um, didn't know anything about him, really didn't know anything about psychedelics. This is about 10 years ago. And I, uh, first time just somebody talked about psychedelics in the way Terrence McKenna does. And then um, I, I was hooked and I listened to him like so much over the course, course of a year, other people, Alan Watts and, and um, others um, along the same subject lines. And I just realized so much of the language that they used, and this is why I was still a fully active Mormon, realized that so much of the language they used was similar to the language that the early Mormons used to describe their visionary experiences. And there was a particular phrase they heard one time, and I'm like, this is so Mormon. I've got to look this up to see if anybody's done any research on Joseph Smith potentially using psychedelics. So I hadn't touched any intoxicating substances in my life to that point, but I just realized through listening to McKenna how similar the experiences were to earlier Mormonism. And that's when I found this paper that we're talking about from Robert Beckstead. And then for me personally, once I found it, and believed that Joseph Smith was using psychedelics and early Mormonism in a strange way that allowed me to give myself permission to explore them. And so I didn't have my first psychedelic experience until after I already um, believed that Joseph Smith was using psychedelics. I was, I was kind of outside of uh, the Mormon sphere when I, when I discovered it, I found it similarly, but um maybe I was a little more disgruntled and <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but I remember I had to go through seminary um, and I remember getting in trouble for asking too many questions about the visionary period of Mormonism uh, and why it didn't happen anymore. Uh, but then I was like 18, 19, took LSD for the first time and had a full blown religious experience. I was like, this is what they were talking about. And like Alex, you're like, I, I, the imagery is stark. Like this is what they were describing. Um, and I, it was a few years before I stumbled onto Beckstead's paper and started studying it seriously. But that initial experience, that it was, it was palpable how, uh, how similar the the language was. Yeah, very interesting. Um, now, what was available to them in in the re like at the very beginning, or when it was supposed that Joseph was doing? Um, or using psychoactive compounds, what was available to him in that area? And what what's the thought on? Was it a variety of things? Was it one compound in particular? Like what was going on? So we think it, it was a variety of things. Um, the earliest things that he likely would have had access to, or familiarity with, were Amanita muscaria and Um There's actually reports that strongly suggest that. His maternal grandfather, his mom, and his dad were all using all three of those substances, or all, both of those substances during their life. Um, and all just prior to Joseph's own first vision. And his own first vision has all of sort of the anticholinergic symptomology. Like, it lines up perfectly. So it's um, early on, those were probably the two main candidates. Um, however... There also is psilocybin species that grows in the area, um, henbane, belladonna. Uh, later on in Nauvoo, we think ergot was a possibility. Um, mandrake. Afraid, mandrake. Essentially all of the hexing herbs. Uh, yeah. yeah, the tropane thing in. really gets me. I really, I mean, I, I understand, obviously, it's a psychoactive compound, but like not pleasant at all. <laughs> so well, like, not all the visions were pleasant no no i I know i know but i'm just saying i just don't i mean i guess back then they didn't really know have the the knowledge of the compounds like as we do from like a breakdown standpoint but um but yeah it's just it i mean even going back now i you always think like oh mushrooms and but like no the the romans were spiking their wine with tons of tropanes and it was all tropanes all the way down pretty much so yeah so I think like Amanita muscaria is a, a particularly potent one that they would have used, especially early on. Um, 
like his so his mom lucy mack when they were living in tunbridge vermont she records this dream that she had that is almost identical to a ton of Amanita muscaria reports that i've seen um and a year and a half ago i actually went back i was doing research and went back and found the foundation of the house that they were living on so we were on their property and their their old uh rock wall still standing a few years ago they did an archaeological dig at the smith family homestead there where they they dug and found the foundation of the home they did soil analysis where they found the exact species of hops that they were growing because the smiths were beer brewers so they knew how to work with herbs and like lucy mack smith she was known for having incredibly heady beer like she was a master at it but while we, we were there in september of 2022 and we walk across the street into the forest that was on their property and there's just amanita muscaria everywhere just hundreds of them so i one of these days i want to go back and do a, a soil analysis to see if we can find spores to prove that amanita was on their property at the time that they were there because we already figured out the species of hops that they were growing at the time um so that's one candidate that they for sure would have had almost for sure would well, have had access the to. weird thing you say that is the one experience i did have with amanita was only like a weird dream scenario i mean obviously they're more of like a hypnotic than they are i mean um you know be careful anybody listening to you gotta decarboxylate to get the ibotanic acid out and everything so um but uh yeah so the one experience I did have was very dream heavy. And I, and, and in that regard, I felt like how could anybody have anything visionary from this? But I guess if you think about it from the dream standpoint, cause it's not like psilocybin where, you know, you're having this transcendent experience, you know, in, in waking conscience, consciousness kind of a thing. Yeah. There's a, one of the, uh, and I have, I have to qualify this. Okay, I'm not the researcher. I'm the director of the film. So we got two two researchers in the room. If I'm stepping out of bounds in, in any way, please jump in. Okay, um, but this is one of the main books that Robert Beckstead uh, references in his paper, and it's Magic Mushrooms and Religion and Alchemy. And so, uh, Amanita, from my experience talking to psychedelic people, is one of the lesser used. Um, mushrooms or psychedelics of today um i have had some minor experiences with them i've never dosed it properly to have a major experience or anything and i had drastically different things that happened in the three times that i tried it but nothing ever breakthrough visionary or anything like that but for whatever reason i mean especially this author his name's clark heinrich um the book is magic mushrooms and religion and alchemy he's very high on this idea and talks about his personal experiences with Amanita muscaria and, and also all the research that he did with it. But one of the interesting things that he does in the end is that he details one of his personal experiences, which is he and a friend went um, to a cabin and just basically ate mushrooms. Like that was their primary source of food for X number of hours. I think it was more than a day even. And then uh, if I remember correctly, they also drank their own pee because that was one of the keys to actually instigate the experience. But when they did that, they started reading the Bible and then he starts talking about, and he's not a Christian. I don't think he is Clark Heinrich. I think he's just reading a spiritual book or whatever, but they read the Bible and then they have a visionary experience that, that Robert Beckstead quotes in this first paper, because it is so similar to what happened to Joseph Smith and the, in what Mormons refer to as the first vision. And so, um, has an experience with the father, you know, who, um, who then calls him by name and like recognizes him and gives him some sort of honor or whatever it is, says, I see you type, type experience. So this is, you know, one person's experience who is a researcher into Amanita. Um, I've never had that experience myself. I've never come across somebody personally, but he's high on it. Well, the, uh, there is obviously the Siberian shamans and some people conflate that with like Santa Claus. I don't think that that's true. Um, I think that there's other origins for that, but I do think that there is tribe in Siberia and it, there's videos of like them drinking the reindeer's piss after the reindeer eats the Amanita. Um, so that that's real, <laughs> whether that's what activates it or not, or maybe it needs to pass through 
a kidney or a liver or something. I have no idea. But um, to your point, I mean, my experience, like I said, was very dream heavy. It was like a hypnotic feeling. It wasn't. I heard somebody say this and I've never done Blue Lotus, but they said it was very akin to Blue Lotus where it's kind of like just chill, you know, hypnotic, not really too much. It's not like, again, not like psilocybin or one of the classic uh, 5-HT2A receptor psychedelics. It, se- it seems less reliable from what I've read. Terrence McKenna wasn't keen on it either. Um, and uh, But, uh, I mean, from my personal experience, and I, I think the most I tried was one and a half caps. And um, what did happen to me, and this was before I was very, very experienced in psychedelics at all. I hadn't even tried, um, I haven't had my true psilocybin trip yet. Um, so it was, it was like greatly experimental. And I... I tried it, I think it was the third time in about a week that I tried it, because I was in New Zealand at the time, and they just happened to be growing everywhere. They were all over the place. And so um, I tried them one night, and I fell asleep shortly after, which I think is common with people with Amanita. And then um, I woke up, and I felt like super invigorated. And I wasn't exercising at the time or anything. And I just like, I was like, man, I want to go outside and run. And it's like one o'clock in the morning. And it's like, I want to go running. I'm like, I can't go running right now. I don't even know where I am. I'm in New Zealand, middle of nowhere. And then I'm like, I'm just going to do push ups. And I just like started doing push ups. Like, and it just like get because I had all this energy in me. And, and it's like, it, it felt beyond placebo. Now, it may have been placebo. I don't think it was because it was very abnormal for me to have that. And then I sat down and I wrote for like three hours straight, just like nonstop. And so that was my most um, potent Amanita experience, but I did not see Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, that's interesting. And, and, you know, everybody is different. I mean, you could give 10 people the same dose of psilocybin. They'd all have, you know, drastically different experiences. Now there is crossover sometimes and there's like weird synchronicity things that happen if you dose with people and things like that, maybe there's some sort of connection, but we're all different. We all have different biochemistry and breakdowns in our GI tracts and different things. So um, I agree with you about the Amanita though. I feel like it, it's, it's not, it's not as consistent as a lot of the other psychoactive compounds, especially mushrooms. So yeah. well, I think uh, we, we, open the possibility for this being any number of things. And I think it was probably even seasonal. Um, like it was, what was available? When was it available? How long was it available? How much did we harvest? Um, and a lot of these guys were skilled enough at, at herb craft that you could use a number of things to get the same uh, result. Um, and I think while a lot of these, Thing, the experiences are subjective. Uh, the ceremonial, ritualistic aspect of how Joseph was administering these things uh, plays a huge part in how he could orchestrate large numbers of people to have shared visionary experiences um, and that were often precluded by like a sacrament ceremony where he was handing out what he called consecrated wine, which in you know occultism and esoteric circles it often means it's laced with something. Um, and then he would go on talking. The sermons would last, and you know, like an hour, hour and a half into the the ceremony, people start having visions. Uh, uh, and then there's other uh, times when they're in more private settings, and you know, people are smoking things. They're doing anointing ceremonies with oil. There, there's a million vehicles <laughs> that this could have been uh, transmitted through at the time that Joseph was operating. Um, and it, it's, it's it's stark that all of these practices are no longer part of Mormonism. And that's also why they don't seem to have visions anymore. Uh, (laughs) At least from my perspective. Is there any written doctrines within the religion that, I mean, obviously they go by the Bible or whatever, but like, is there anything else that maybe would point to something that was written down about this stuff or? I I would say Often the um, Joseph had kind of a public personality and a private personality. Um, he had things he would advocate publicly, and he would uh, often do counter <laughs> that uh, pri- privately. Um, 
and but he was very clever about how he'd word things so the, for example the document the word of wisdom is a revelation that joseph gave that uh, kind of dictates mormons dietary restrictions so that's that's why they today don't drink coffee or tea um but when joseph originally gave it there's a lot of legal wiggle room for what you can incorporate he he says like all herbs uh, and plants under God are sanctioned by our use uh, as long as you you uh, they're consecrated with an eye to God. So basically, if you, you like anything's fair game. <laughs> if There's another if revelation that where Joseph is told by God to only use wine of his own make for the sacraments. So he was explicitly in charge, and whoever he put in charge of making the sacramental wine which leaves it wide open saying, hey, you, you can't bring in other wine. Like you have to use this stuff that we are making for you. What makes this like especially challenging for a Mormon today is that there's so, so much of their belief is um, centered around not taking these substances. And when I say these substances, I'm talking specifically alcohol, tobacco, drugs of any form other than something prescribed to you by a doctor, which a lot of Mormons are kind of over medicated, but, um, but any, but other forms of intoxications, coffee and tea are specifically outlawed. And so um, also they don't use wine in their sacrament or communion anymore. They use water in a piece of bread. So there is no, no room for any intoxication in Mormonism. So if you're coming in and telling them in your early days, your visionary experiences were coming from what we now label as psychedelics it's really challenging for people. So when did that change? And like, was there one person leading the charge on this kind of like a prohibition on compounds or how did that evolve? So it kind of, it died out with Joseph because Joseph was the herbalist and he had the people, um, he always had the herbal herbalist on his, you know, as his right hand man. And then he sort of, he was killed off. And there was sort of this struggle for power within Mormonism and it kind of schismed. And so the main church followed a guy named Brigham Young, where they, they essentially had to leave Nauvoo, uh, Illinois. And that's when they did their pioneer trek out West. So in part it died off because Brigham a wasn't as mystically minded as Joseph. He didn't give a damn about the visions like Joseph did. Um, he was more interested in the economic side. Um, and then they move west to a new locale, new plants. And so they were kind of essentially cut off of their original sources of the material. So that that's really one of the biggest reasons it changes. It went through a theological shift. So it was no longer okay to have these visionary experiences. Like they, they explicitly link in an 1850 conference of the church, they explicitly link the older grand visions with apostates and they say oh the real members the strong members they just have the you know the still small voice that cody was talking about earlier you know they don't have these grand visions sort of thing so it gets completely taken away both theologically so what's the small voice is that you mean like like a inner like dialogue or something like like everybody has no. got like a inner voice you know like you consult yeah. with like that's not like a special mormon thing they know that right mormons will tell you it is though <laughs> that, that's the thing that testifies testifies of truth okay, so throw like up that leonardo dicaprio meme of him behind the camera laughing you know from uh, <laughs> uh, uh but yeah that's uh yeah, I don't know. That's 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 interesting. But like at the same time, it's just like so much of this stuff, especially with religions and not just Mormonism, like a lot of religions, it's just the same stuff. Like most of these people don't know the origins of what they're believing in. Like at very least, let's say you consider yourself a good Christian or a good uh, Muslim or whatever, Mormon, whatever. Wouldn't you, aren't you, shouldn't you know like the ins and outs of where this came from? Like from historically too, like what archaeological evidence, is there any archaeological evidence? Is there any um, linguistic evidence, text, like things like that? Like none of these people know any of that stuff. And, and it's, well, the you know. The modern church actively suppresses its history and tells pe it, people not to study it. You know, you can only study it from the official sources 
um, which is the church itself and, you know, it's token apologists. And, you know, they, they kind of shy away and play down Joseph's treasure digging, you know, his magical practices, the fact that, you know, the temple ceremony, the main temple ceremony for Mormons is pulled from masonry. Um, like in the 90s, especially in, in the early 2000s, there was one of the head church leaders who basically went after all of the divergent Mormon historians um, and theologians and excommunicated all of them. You know, the guy who did the groundbreaking work on Mormonism and magic, they excommunicated him. They excommunicated uh, a bunch of people talking about, you know, Heavenly Mother, the idea that God was married and, you know, we should be worshiping both Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, excommunicated them. And so it's so funny were... you say that I was just cutting up a clip of I did an episode with cannabis historian Chris Bennett. Um, and we were talking about uh, El or um, Tel Arad and the temple in, um, in early Judaism where they found cannabis resin. And they had two standing stones, one for God the Father and one for, I think, Asherah, the mother goddess. And I think in the museum they took the mother goddess out. So it's just the one. So it's like, what are we doing here? We're trying to, like revise history like no we come from i mean aside from akhenaten everything's pretty much polytheistic you know so i don't know well in in, in mormonism specifically you you have this issue that there's there's not just you know an evolution in in how the history is presented but like even in joseph's days like when he started the church his attitude about psychedelics and and visionary experiences was like everybody should share this we should give this to whoever wants it and then that kind of didn't really work out so great and the pr was getting bad so he he revised that now it's like okay now only in the sacrament ceremonies only for members only and even that didn't seem to work out so great for him. So it got it like, okay, only in the school of the prophets when we're in with our inner circle. And, and then it evolved to, okay, we're going to build a temple and we're going to have these secret special ceremonies that we're only going to do for people that are worthy enough to be in the temple. So even if you're Mormon, you have to be this a certain kind of Mormon to be able to have access to these things. So there's an evolution of like who had access to these ceremonies within Joseph's t lifetime. And then uh, like Alex was talking about, he dies, there's this church schism, everybody kind of starts practicing their own version of Mormonism. And, and you have, you ha we have to trace these histories each time it schisms, each time it changes. So th this, uh, this process of uncovering this information is, is very long and very tedious. And it's like, in in the deepest weeds you can possibly get in mormon history um which is why it's it's taken so long to kind of uncover all this have you guys shown this to anybody that's still a practicing like devout mormon and what did they have to what was their feedback on it yeah i mean i've i've showed it shown it to my oldest sister who there's six kids in my family and she's probably the most hardcore mormon amongst the six and uh, but what's interesting is that mormons are like big into essential oils and they're big into like homeopathy and and she was into that stuff and and i'm like in her studying of that because she went to school to study it it's like she had to have come across psychedelics she must have and i talked to her about it one time and she didn't and that was still she went in a time when psychedelics weren't as mainstream as they are right now but i'm like well since she did that she might be open to this idea so I had a couple conversations with her and like there were probably about two hours each where I talked about this, this topic with her and she was actually very open to it, which was pretty shocking to me because Mormons generally do not like to be challenged in things that are like very wayward from their normal belief system. And um, so I showed her the documentary and she was, she was very open to it afterwards. She told me the two things she was offended by in it. I told her before she watched it, I said, if you stop watching it, tell me exactly where you stop because I want to know where it is that you get uncomfortable and see if we can perhaps address that or consider addressing it, do it differently. She got through the whole thing. She was offended by one thing that happened in the closing credits and she was offended in the last shot before the closing credits. And um, But we've been able to have probably four or five more than 60 minute conversations about this topic as a result of my involvement in the documentary and she is very straight laced Mormon. So, so I don't know if 
uh, she's eventually going to try psychedelics, but she is at the point where she's at least like open to that conversation, which is pretty shocking to me. No, that's awesome. I mean, look, <laughs> we've talked with a lot of, you know, we've talked about a lot of dogmatic people. We've done this show now for over six years uh, within these fringe communities and religions and psychedelics and all this different stuff. And, you know, everybody is very productive, protective over their community. Um, one thing I will say, though, is we're all human beings, too. I think we all deep down love a good mystery and like do want to unfold like what the truth is of the matter. But there is this weird thing, which I will say, which I had like a spiritual experience, like a, an awakening or whatever, reawakening like seven years ago. Um, and I've talked about it on the podcast and stuff. And that's kind of what led us to do the podcast. And I was very into like a lot of woo things. Um, and through that process, I've whittled it down. I'm like, oh, so like most of that was bullshit. There is some interesting aspects to these things. Then maybe I can see what this true fringe is all about. But um, until you get on that path, you don't know. And I think that with what we see in society right now, a lot of people abandoning religion and you see people need that whole filled. And you can even go back to Plato's dialogues where um, I think Socrates is talking about how um, you need a higher order or, or a higher power to believe in or else things start to decay, you become an immoral person. So um, I think that if you can offer these explanations like you with your sister and this documentary and just having these kind of open minded conversations on these things, I think we can get to a place where it's like, maybe you can keep some of these traditions or these rituals or whatever with the understanding of how it got there without all the dogma and the, the, you know, the controlling and all that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's actually kind of funny. There's a, a mushroom tr church that started here in Utah by a couple ex Mormons, Steve and Sarah Urquhart. It's called the divine assembly. And it's basically this giant group of ex Mormons who have all found psychedelics and get together and we talk about it and whatnot. And the one tenant of the church is, you know, everybody can access the divine on their own terms sort of thing using the sacrament, of course, psilocybin. Um, but it's really fun to sort of see all of these people kind of come together and be like, all right, yeah, we're trying to make sense of these experiences. We're trying to understand it. And the majority of us all come from the same Mormon background where it's very strict, very dogmatic. And we're kind of trying to play around with, okay, well, what does it look like to, you know, think about these experiences non-dogmatically, to look at our history non-dogmatically. And so it's this really kind of cool little, counterculture that's developed in utah based around psychedelics yeah that's very interesting and you, again you see that now i've seen people uh combine christianity and psychedelics people tapping into the ancient soma or homa and the psychedelic rituals and stuff like that um one thing i i always question too is like the people that don't question it like what are you what are you doing like you're not <laughs> You think these people experience some sort of magic, just these few people, some magical shit happened that's never happened again in the history of the world. And those are the people that experience it. And only them are that blessed and it'll never happen again. And you're just supposed to just believe it like from a logic and a reason standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, well, I, I, I mean, I, oh, go ahead, Cody. Sorry. I think I think there's this uh, knee jerk reaction people get by the idea of us like trying to understand how these things worked or like trying to replicate them is almost like an act of blasphemy uh, rather than understanding um, or it's just like a matter of perspective. It's like we're we're worshiping the same as you. I, I just want to know how it works and I want to be able to replicate it. Uh, um, and some people just the very act that you're trying to understand it is in itself like offensive like you said it's it's like how dare you try, try to figure yeah. that out this was just for them yeah well and, and what's interesting too is you know mormons seem very attached to this idea that it's all on god's terms like we have no say really in our relationship to god other than being obedient and following all these rules and you know if we are and we're lucky enough, you know, God might give us these breadcrumb experiences. Oh, he helped me find my keys. Oh, you know, something like that. Whereas, like, the way Joseph understood it early on and the way, you know, 
even we're trying to navigate this is like, no, it, it's a relationship with God. You know, there's, there's this two part, two way street between you and the divine and you have some say in how these experiences go and whether or not you have them, you know, and psychedelics are sort of a way that we work, can work through that and have this two way street. And that for a lot of Mormons is really hard to swallow because, you know, they're so, um, I don't want to say brainwashed, but kind of brainwashed to go that, oh, only, you know, the people with authority above you can receive revelation. I mean, and, you could you could even, you don't even need to bring, I mean, I understand that's what we're talking about, but you don't even need to invoke psychedelic stuff. You could just say meditation versus prayer, because the way I look at it is meditation is kind of like a two-way, you know, thing happening as opposed to prayer, which is like, oh, please help me, you know, I need your help, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it just seems like needy and what are you doing kind of a thing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I get it. And some people have crazy mystical experiences after they do that when they actually really do need that. So, I mean, I'm not like one to poo poo anything. Um, but I will say that I don't like dogmatism on any side, whether it's religious, non-religious, I mean, even science, you know, science, scientism is a real thing too. So it's like, I'm all about balance. Let's balance out what we know. Like, is it possible to know some of these things? cool well what would be a reasonable explanation for why these exper people experienced these mystical and metaphysical things that anybody else in day-to-day -day consciousness isn't experiencing and unless maybe they have like schizophrenia or some sort of chemical imbalance you know and that's a whole different story so um but from that standpoint it's just again I don't understand how more people aren't curious and then you they get defensive about it without actually even knowing anything about it you know, you know, something that's interesting, another sister of mine, my second oldest sibling, she's left uh, Mormonism as well. But one of the things that kept her in for for probably longer than was necessary, if that's the right word, um, was that she couldn't explain why the early church members were having such visionary experiences that she felt like she was doing something bad against her ancestors by leaving the church. That's how she viewed this. Like these people were so important that God gave them visionary experiences. I think that that's how some people view it, that like this was such a special time in history and it's not going to happen again. And if you leave, you're doing a disservice to your ancestors. And I think that that played in, in my sister. And it was actually through conversations with her when it, this, this, her leaving the faith was when it wasn't as involved in the research. And that's sad. That's sad that she yeah. felt that way, like isolated and something that should have been like propping her up or giving her community and a good feeling like that. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's the kind of stuff. It's just like, um, you know, that shame. It's like, am I not doing that right? And as I mentioned earlier, I kind of felt that way growing up you know being catholic and going to catholic schools at an early age and stuff and going to church multiple times a week like i never like oh this is like a chore it's not even doing anything for it and how are we right and all these other people are wrong that doesn't i you know i started thinking about that when i was like 11 years old too like this doesn't make any sense um but we're all starting from different places and i mean it's good that your sister found sounds like she found um her way on that and uh you have to do what's right for you. And some people thrive at having some sort of direction or, um, you know, they need I, that, that thing, whatever that's, that's that sky daddy, uh, sky daddy to fall back on, you know? I mean, look, that's real by the way, because when I, I, this, I forgot to mention this when I was going through my spiritual awakening, I was believing more in like one higher energy power type thing. And it gave me a lot of, peace and comfort and i have bad ocd anybody that watches the show so it's like that's another reason why i've used psychedelics in the past so it's like um there is something to that where you cannot replicate it through anything else that that feeling that like oh somebody else has got me kind of a thing is very intoxicating and on one one end of it i do kind of see if okay so maybe that offers those people comfort but from like a, like i said like a reason and logic standpoint it doesn't make any sense at all no i mean another thing with, with this and, and we've kind of like um hit on it a few different ways and talking so far is that like it 
you could look at our documentary and it's like, what is the intent behind this? Why did they make this? Are they trying to destroy Mormonism? Are they trying to tell me that my faith is invalid? Are they telling me the church is bad or anything like that? And it's like, we, we make this very clear, especially in the second to last scene where there's a round table discussion with the three main researchers where, um, this is, there are many ways to explain what was happening in early Mormonism. People are going to take it in different ways. If they, they take this entheogen theory seriously, Oh, Joseph Smith was just, um, you know, um, drugging the people without them knowing it. And it's like, sure, you can say that. But it's also like, if you use plant medicines yourself or entheogens, it's pretty hard to say, just dismiss it away. You know, it's, it's to, to say there's something there after you have it is not a long shot, you know. And so to then work with entheogens and see like, Maybe they were using this in early Mormonism, and if they were, maybe I should try this too, and maybe it will help redefine my faith and my relationship with the divine. And that's what more of this is. It's just giving people another tool to connect and empower themselves um, as opposed to um, going on and, and with, with, the, with the faith as it is. This is just something else that you can do to develop your relationship with the divine, and just like they were in early Mormonism. Another point I, I want to make. Oh, Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Mike. Okay. No, I, I was um, just I was just gonna make a give you a compliment. Like from watching the documentary, I didn't get any vibes of like you shitting on Mormonism or taking shots at it or belittling it. I didn't get any of the and in fact, that's why I asked you if you guys were in one because I didn't know what to expect from this conversation. I thought maybe one of you was still in or not in. Like I that's what I'm saying. It's just like uh it's pretty ambiguous from that standpoint. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be worried that I, I guess I shouldn't say that because I'm not coming from Mormonism. But as an outsider watching it, I didn't get the vibes that you were like selling it or anything. You're just giving like a breakdown of like the history and then these connections that you felt like were important to its history, if that makes sense. That's good to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, I like that. That's that's really nice to hear, Espe especially from somebody that's not Mormon, actually. I, I really like that. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, I wanted to make a point about you were talking about, oh, um, uh, Joseph drugging the other people kind of thing, and they may may or may not know. One thing I think is like Joseph understood himself to essentially be like a hierophant. You know, he was he was functioning in the same sort of way that the priests at the Temple of Eleusis were, you know, trying to facilitate this specific kind of experience in the people. So I think he, he kind of viewed his role as doing whatever was necessary to get people to that space. So I don't think there was any malintent on his part. You know, he, he was like, you know, I'm a higher fan. I'm, I'm supposed to give these visions to people. And this is one of the tools that I have that most reliably gives people this type of vision. And so really, you know, in his sense, it's an altruistic move of, hey, you know, if they're struggling to see the divine, let me aid them in that process kind of thing. And that also bring, like, brings up another point. Like, uh, we are at no point trying to give a gotcha to Mormonism. We're not trying to, you know, dismember it by proving this theory. And that's also to say that, like, yeah, Not right, Cody. Off line, you were saying you're like I'm Leah Remini number two, Cody. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming. Oh, you got me. Um, and we're also not saying that like every visionary experience was precluded by psychedelics. Like there were plenty of people and individuals who were doing this through prayer or meditation or singing hymns or whatever it was that was their jam. What we're really emphasizing is the times when Joseph told a congregation of people like you're going to see the savior. And then he delivered that after delivering the sacrament. Like those are the things we're trying. You know, it's this is just another weird aspect to a very weird history. It's not, you know, the this we go, we finally got him, guys. <laughs> it just sounds like he was an ancient American shaman, like not like Native yeah. American, but just like an ancient American medicine person that um, connected that to Christianity. Is like if you went off the descriptions you all gave or whatever like that's kind of how i would think about it i wouldn't think about it as opposed to how i did think about it before which was like this very like wackadoodle origin story you know like and i'm not trying to be mean just like that's from an outsider that's the perspective and i i feel that way about a lot of things so it's not just this but um but that's the vibe that i used to get and now 
looking at this, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And and we've talked about that on this podcast, like I said, for the last six years, whether it be the Lucidian Mysteries or the go back to any of the ancient mystery schools, Egyptian mystery schools, anything. There was definitely mind altering things happening, whether it was deep meditation, psychedelics, entheogens, um, near death experiences, you know, and in, inducing these different states like that's been happening forever. So to correlate that to what you're talking about is not that far of a stretch. I think that the disconnect is it's so much more recent than all those other ones that we don't really think about it like that. But I think that, you know, the work that you guys have done is great. I know PD Newman kind of looks into that time frame too, um, as well as like alchemy and stuff like that. And there's a lot of stuff happening there. So there's a lot of crossover too. Uh, PD and, and I particularly, I've I've talked to them a number of times about about this kind of thing. Um, uh, and the masonry alchemy the aspect of this definitely uh, crosses over with the Mormon side of that. They were all uh, deeply embedded in that kind of esotericism. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Is Another there a... Thing, yeah, go ahead. No, you, you first, Mike. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to shift a bit because, um, I mean, at that time, you know, we have the Second Great Awakening happening and visions are a lot are a lot more common at the time than in other periods in, you know, American Christianity especially. Um, and one thing in favor of, you know, the psychedelic use of Mormons is even the people with crazy visions were like, holy shit, what are these Mormons doing? Like they're, they're wackadoo kind of thing. But I think, I actually think that, you know, in the second great awakening, psychedelic use was a lot more common than we realize in part because of the medicines that they were using at the time. You know, I've been doing a lot of research into trying to understand um, like the uses of Datura and Belladonna at the time. And you know, I've been canvassing all these medical textbooks from the late 17, early 1800s in the United States and Deturas throughout all of them. Like they were giving decently high doses of Datura to patients, you know, suffering with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, epilepsy. Um, it was supposed to help with allergies, even like all of these different things that Datura was being used for. So it's not that far of a, a reach to go, OK, you know, maybe maybe this person who's suffering really badly from rheumatism, you know, they, they take their Datura medicine at night and they wake up and go to church first thing in the morning. They're predisposed to have these sorts of visions like they're they, they're on a, a micro dose or whatever, or have been dosing it multiple times, you know, over the course of days or even months. They, they had like three month treatment courses with Datura for epilepsy at the time. Like, so these people are ingesting these psychoactive substances on a regular basis, you know, the, maybe the morning of going to church. And so maybe part of the reason, you know, there were all these visions. Yes, it was cultural. Yes, it was social. But maybe it was also because of the generalized medicine at the time, which would make, you know, Joseph's use of it not that strange because he had doctors all around him all the time who are using these and who are studying cutting edge medicine yeah that's interesting i mean and it's definitely found everywhere at least in the you know united states east midwest you know all the, throughout there for sure um yeah again the tropane things kind of <laughs> i mean it's so prevalent but it's just like that's that can't be fun, right? I mean, like, are people going, like, looking for that darkness? You know, that's the kind of thing that I wonder. Um, going for their shadow side? Yeah, working on their shadow or entering the shadow or whatever. But um, I remember, too, like, who was it that we had on? Dr. Andrew Gallimore. And that was because we were yeah. talking about um, the difference between, like, phenethylamines tryptamines and like tropanes and it seems like whether like aside from like the value of is one better than or is it does one reveal more or whatever um it just seems like pro or tro propane tropanes is more akin to like an actual vision of something that's not there as opposed to a tryptamine which you're looking at the wall and it's kind of moving a little or the ground patterns flowing or um, whatever the case may be, something that's more 
psilocybin based or LSD or DMT. Um, but I just remember that conversation thinking that maybe that is the source of all the gods and goddesses is the tropane stuff. Cause it, it, people are just, again, and maybe there's something to it that's metaphysical that's manifesting in that way or whatever, but just using those compounds to induce those visions is something even more wild than what we know as modern psychedelics and those experiences, at least from my hundreds of experiences that I've had. Yeah. Well, and I mean, what's a particular note frequently in a lot of these Mormon visions is they're talking to people that aren't there that, you know, only one or two or three sees. I mean, in these, uh, grand visions you know the temple dedication and stuff a lot more people are seeing all these different people but you know you read some of the visions that joseph has or that joseph and one other person has and it reads as like everybody's just sitting there watching him and he and his fellow person are you know just talking to an angel like oh yeah hey uh peter james and john are right here and we're we're talking to him hey elijah's right here and we're having a conversation with him kind of thing so i mean it lines up perfectly with you know seeing somebody that isn't there it's just augmenting your reality a little bit yeah very interesting and then you got the outlier salvia but they would have had to go to like walta mexico to find that it's like a very specific yeah region i don't mexico. think salvia I don't think, I, don't think, I don't think that was horrible. around back then yeah it's a new world probably the maya knew about it but um all right so what are we missing here? Is there anything we didn't touch on yet that you, any one of you want to touch on that we didn't get to? Cody, I think we should bring up Fred M. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, uh, one of the most exciting and weirdest parts of this whole thing that I, I like to uh, bring up is, um, so we talked about Joseph, this visionary period kind of died out um, and the church schismed. One of the um, offshoots of this church was, um, uh, the community of Christ, what's now called the community of Christ or the uh, RLDS faction of the church. Um, and they were kind of following a, um, what is it? A paternal bloodline. Uh, the next people in line to take over after Joseph were his, it was his son. Um, and, and so uh, Joseph Smith, the third took over the reorganized church um, and his son, Fred M. Smith, who is Joseph's paternal grandson, was one of the first psychologists in the United States. Um, he he um, studied at Columbia. Um, uh, I think G. Stanley Hall was his mentor. Um, he wrote a, a PhD dissertation on altered states of consciousness, specifically religious states of ecstasy, as he called it. Um, and he was a huge peyote advocate. Uh, what's kind of ironic about all this is this history was was lost and Joseph's grandson unintentionally kind of picked it back up um, because he was trying to find a, a source for how to replicate revelation in the way that his grandfather had. And he stumbles across peyote in the early uh, 20th century. Um, and as a psychologist and a standing Mormon prophet, he has a very interesting perspective on altered states of consciousness and specifically religious states uh, or, or religious uh, rituals that uh, uh, induce these states. Um, and so he, uh, being a peyote advocate, was like sharing it with his friends and uh, going to um, uh, tribes that were associated with Mormon missionaries um, and, and taking peyote ceremonies. Um, he he sent some peyote to his daughter alice uh who was going to school at the time and she didn't seem to like it very much but she she did have a friend uh virgil thompson who is who was going to harvard who was hanging around and uh through one way or another uh, fred m uh, her dad and her and uh, virgil thompson struck up a relationship and he started giving peyote buttons to virgil thompson under the um under the the agreement that Virgil Thompson would give him like research data, he would basically give him uh, here's my anecdotal report for my experiences. Um, but he liked it so much he went back to Harvard and started sharing peyote with his other artistic, you know, musician friends, and um, they started the Harvard Aesthetics Club um, that helped spread the use of peyote and you know help kick the beatnik movement and a number of other things. Um, but what we don't know, or what's lost to kind of the um, 
the birth of the psychedelic renaissance as we know it is that this this psilocybin project in the 1950s and 60s that kicked off the psychedelic renaissance was precluded by another psychedelic club at harvard in the 1920s that was being funded peyote by a mormon prophet and this isn't speculative this is you know there's this is all documented uh, uh fred m wrote a whole book where he has a chapter about how great peyote is um we have the so journals <laughs> and the memoirs of Virgil Thompson, the daughter, talking about passing it around at Harvard. So, you know, the psychedelic renaissance started at Harvard just 40 years prior to what we think it, when we think it started with Timothy Leary and whatnot. <laughs> and it was that's, sparked by a more another one. That, that's <laughs> another one that grows in a very specific area, peyote, right on the border of Texas and Mexico. Actually, that's, I think, from what I understand, that habitat's dwindling as well, so... I yeah. mean, obviously, we have the resources to, you know, replicate. There's tons of people growing San Pedro and um, peyote out there. But, yeah, it's still sad, right? Yeah. Um, that's super That's super interesting. And it's, uh, it's always Harvard involved with these psychedelic, uh, <laughs> right? Um, but... It doesn't surprise me that, I mean, I didn't know about that. That's actually pretty early, a lot earlier than I would have thought. Um, but it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, do you think that, well, do you think that that kind of stuff was getting around? Like anything trading wise? Like that's what I was going to ask you too, is like, would it have been something definitely local to Joseph or could it have been, things like obviously forever things have been traded so could it have been something that they got through trading i mean i would probably rule well i mean cannabis obviously the cannabis plants that grow are more hemp uh, related at this point or hemp variety naturally here to the americas but um i think yeah. uh cody had to pop out which yeah shout well, out to cody no, no thank you so much cody if you're watching or listening to this later we really appreciate your expertise and knowledge um yeah. but yeah so what well, do you think about the... Talk to the the last thing because th there's a chance that joseph smith would have had access to peyote um he sent Mormon missionaries down to the texas mexico border where peyote is um one guy named lyman white and they brought stuff back to him you know from the native americans so and this is evidenced by he had a stone that essentially looks like hollowed out peyote essentially um and there's an image of it in the paper that i'll have you link to the entheogenic origins of mormonism that's just fascinating so there there is a solid chance that joseph at some point or another had access to peyote through either some sort of trade but especially through these missionaries that he sent back down to texas and what's interesting is that um, the fellow that he sent down, Lyman White, was one of the guys who's had had many visionary experiences in early Mormonism that were most likely psychedelic in nature. Like, that's a whole other tangent. But after Joseph died, Lyman White essentially started his own sect back down in that area of Texas. And they built a temple and they had all of these incredible visionary experiences down there so it clearly didn't die with joseph in that sense it moved down with lyman white this this sect that interesting you know that they moved back down to this peyote region and were having similar type visionary experiences that we are arguing are psychedelic experiences with joseph so it's very likely that joseph had access to something like that yeah that's interesting and again, it could just be a variety of stuff too, right? I mean, that's the that's the problem with all this stuff and it doesn't get written down or it's esoteric knowledge that wasn't properly passed down or, you know, missing links in that chain or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you, you get that with a lot of stuff, you know, whether you're looking into like Soma or the Kekian from the Eleusinian Mysteries. Yeah, we can speculate all day. They still don't, I mean, how... They still don't know how you would separate um, the neurotoxic aspects of, you know, if there was ergot in, as part of Kekian, like how would you separate the psychoactive yeah. components from the 
neurotoxic and that's the problem right so i don't know lots of stuff to consider and think about but I, uh, most of all though i think you guys did an amazing job on the uh documentary is are you guys is that what i saw was that completely done and you're just waiting to kind of put it out there or are you still doing stuff to it yeah we're um that's what it is for now there, there i mean i haven't watched it for probably like four weeks and there there are a couple of things in my mind that have come up since i'm like i gotta check that scene out i might want to change that shot right there um but uh that that's it for now i mean there might be a shot that's replaced here or there timing of something there's this we technically have a song we shouldn't use in the closing credits that we got it we got to check before we show it in public um but that is 99.5 percent the version that you're going to see if you get tickets and you come to salt lake april 27th through 29th or in portland may 11th so um, we're also talking we, about maybe doing an online showing of it for people who aren't local to salt lake and portland <clears throat> yeah so we, we, we i recommend that too i mean even if you do it separately from that whole thing as like a separate event or whatever and let me know too i'll try and get the word out or you guys can come back on for you know a short thing or promote it or whatever let me know and i'll spread the word any way i can i appreciate that yeah we really appreciate that yeah it's been great chatting with you i want to say by the way you've dropped like five or six names that you've had conversations with in this in this episode i'm like oh, who do you have access to like where, where are you pulling these people from Dude, Brandon, I told you, this is why i love this podcast it's like mk ultra bro no i'm just kidding uh <laughs> no i mean i just I, look, I'm interested in all this stuff. It's I'm kind of like an autodidact. I'm not writing books. I mean, I, maybe I will at some point about my own kind of stuff. But this is just a podcast. I'm just really interested in these topics. I really love origins of things and finding out the mystery and looking into the mysteries of life, death, you know, psychology, the mind, all that kind of stuff. So this is just, you know, it's a passion of mine. And uh, I think when I reach out to people, I tell them, hey, this is what I'm doing. And you know that, that's what it is but i appreciate that and i think the people that we've had on are super knowledgeable i like to think that we've done a good job cultivating the knowledge on these topics on this podcast so people aren't kind of getting fed the bs or the stuff that's like way out there the complete woo stuff which is fun to listen to once in a while but i don't you know you can't go too hard yeah. into it but yeah man i appreciate it and you guys are welcome on the show anytime um you know, I'm doing the show once or twice a week usually. So, like I said, feel free if you guys want to come back on before or promote it after you've done your events or whatever. Shoot me a message. We'll try and set it up. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and letting me take a look at it because I do think you did a great job. And as somebody who's made their own documentary now, um, I kind of know how hard it is to do, number one. And number two, like the editing process and everything. It's just... To put something out there that's coherent that makes sense and you guys did a good job of like having like i said the the beginning the background story and then coming in with the, the hypothesis and working off of that so kudos to you i yeah, appreciate that thank you so much mike it's been a pleasure talking to you i'd love to be on again you know with the group to promote it in some form or just have a follow-up conversation this is this has been really good yeah thank you for having us on sweet man yeah thank you and uh yeah alex again you're you're welcome on anytime as well and um yeah check out their documentary when it comes out entheo magus and uh i will put the link uh once alex sends me a message i'll put the link for the paper down below in the show notes and uh, a little bit of more information so check that out um, and if you want to support Mind Escape, the best way to do it is uh, click our link tree link down below. If you're listening to this on an audio platform, um, check out our, our YouTube channel because we do all of our episodes live. Uh, there's no ads or anything on that. However, once the episode's over, there will be ads and there will be ads on Spotify. We do have video episodes on Spotify, though, too. So check that out and uh, check out our documentary as within. So without from UFOs to DMT. Um, the link is down below as well and i think that's it we're gonna wrap it up here again thank you to alex brandon and uh cody who had to drop out shout out to cody we really appreciate you coming in here as long as you did and uh yeah shout out to everybody that was listening and, and sending uh messages out there we appreciate you as well and uh we're gonna end it the way we always do which is we love everybody stay safe out there and uh we'll catch you next time peace